Greetings, and welcome back to the channel. Today I'll look back at the mostly forgotten science fiction films of 1934, none of which are well known by the average fan today, but they do serve as explorations of possible futures, scientific manipulation, rising political tensions, and comedic misadventures from Germany, Argentina, Britain, and a 12-part serial from the United States. Cinema outside sci-fi was still dominated by Hollywood productions and looked towards escapism, better times, and literary adaptations while the world itself was dealing with political instability and the growing clouds of impending global conflict. Societal uncertainties would grow stronger as the decade progressed. The three German films I'll cover in this episode represent some of the final science fiction productions made during the Nazi regime, signaling the decline of the once vibrant cinematic era. With the rise of the new regime and the exodus of Jewish directors, post-1933 German cinema struggled to match the artistic heights achieved in the 1920s with groundbreaking German expressionist films. Harry Peel, a prominent German director, actor, and producer, takes the spotlight in the first two films in this episode. Peel would often cast himself in the leading roles and perform his own stunts. Die Welt ohne Maske, or The World Without a Mask, directed by and starring Peel, alongside notable talents such as Olga Shesheva and Rudolf Klein Roga, best known as Rotwang in Metropolis. An inventor works to perfect a radio television device, while a con artist sees potential to exploit the invention for profit. A freak accident in the lab enhances the device, enabling it to see through objects and project images onto a TV screen. This breakthrough catches the attention of criminals eager to possess the technology. The inventor and his partner also battle corporate greed as they compete to bring television to the public, leading to a usual series of complications. Despite its intriguing premise, the world without a mask falls short of its potential, with a lackluster first half and comedic elements that fail to resonate. However, the film offers glimpses of early explorations into nefarious uses of technology foreshadowing the ethical dilemmas of surveillance and privacy that would become increasingly relevant in the modern era. Director Harry Peel's career soared during the Weimar Republic era before facing challenges due to his affiliation with the Nazi Party after World War II. While not without its flaws, The World Without a Mask remains a noteworthy addition to the canon of 1930s German cinema. Offering a comparison to the groundbreaking cinema of the country's past, as well as insights into the cultural and technological landscape of the time. The German language version without subtitles is available for free on Odyssey, and I'll link it in the description below. Before continuing with the films of 1934, if you're enjoying the content, please give the video a thumbs up and subscribe for more History of Sci Fi episodes. Your support is what keeps this channel thriving, and I'm thankful for everyone stopping by and sharing the love for this amazing genre. Der Herr der Welt, or Master of the World, was directed by Harry Peel and written by Georg Mullen Schulte. The film starred Walter Jansen, Sybil Schmitz, and Walter Frank. Jansen would later be better known more for his voiceover dubbing of Hollywood's leading men's performances, like Clark Gable, for German cinema. And we looked at Schmidt's previous film, 1932's FP1 and Twartet Nicht, in episode 12. The film follows the story of a brilliant scientist who invents a powerful weapon capable of destroying entire cities. However, when he realizes the destructive potential of his creation, he attempts to prevent it from falling into the wrong hands. As tensions rise and nations vie for control of the weapon, our leading man must race against time to prevent a catastrophic global conflict. 
the movie attempts to weave in themes of scientific ethics and the risk inherent in technological supremacy, though this exploration feels underdeveloped and without real depth. The best part of the film is the promotional poster. It promises a giant robot wreaking havoc, but it's blatantly false advertising. The poster is cool and I'd like to see that movie. The robot is just silly, but the world had intriguing elements and the use of machines, spies, and how modern technology fits into a society, that part of the story was never fully realized. It reflects a missed opportunity to critically examine the societal and ethical challenges posed by the technological progress during a turbulent period in German history. The historical backdrop of the Weimar Republic's transition into the Nazi regime, marked by economic strife and unemployment, could have added a poignant layer to the film's commentary on automation taking over human employment. But the narrative shies away from delving into these issues too deeply, perhaps hindered by the political constraints in Germany at the time. Master of the World is available for free on YouTube, and I'll link it in the description below. By 1934, renowned German studio Ufa, best known for Metropolis, was under state control but still producing films. Geld, or Gold in English, boast performances from two of Germany's leading actors of the time. Hans Albers, celebrated for his role in The Blue Angel with Marlena Dietrich, as well as FP1 and Tortig Nicht, and Bridget Helm, best known as Maria in Metropolis. And just like FP1 and Tortit Nicht, Gold was produced in multiple languages to cater to international audiences before the widespread adoption of dubbing became popular. Helm was the only cast member to appear in both the German and French versions. From Austrian director Karl Hartl and writer Rolf V. Von Loh, Gold weaves a narrative around Werner Hulk, played by Hans Albers. The story follows Hulk's quest for vengeance and redemption after his mentor's fatal experiment to convert base metals into gold. Entangled in a web of deceit, he is approached by a British capitalist eager to make use of this scientific breakthrough, setting off a chain of moral dilemmas and possible romance with the capitalist's daughter, played by Bridget Helm. Gold explores the all-consuming nature of greed and ambition. The film was released amid global financial turmoil and Germany's post-World War I recovery, capturing the fascination with the mythical solution of alchemy to mend their economic woes. The story investigates the essence of human greed and the societal upheavals brought about by scientific advancements. The film subtly critiques the dynamics of power by pitting a British antagonist in a battle of wits with a superior German mind. The cinematography, set, and art direction were the standouts. Taking advantage of the modern interest in industrialization, the sets were sold off and reused in 1953's The Magnetic Monster. Otto Hunte's Art Deco designs, alongside the visual effects by Ernst Kunzmann and Theo Nischwitz, as well as Gunter Rittau's cinematography, creates an immersive experience that elevates the film beyond its narrative. These artists were masters in German filmmaking, working in previous films like Der Nibelungen, Metropolis, and The Testament of Dr. Mabuza. Critical reception of gold was mixed, with visuals receiving acclaim while the storyline was seen as lackluster. The New York Times hailed the film's cinematography and ability to engage audiences regardless of language barriers whereas Variety critiqued its reliance on spectacular but ultimately hollow special effects. I agree with the critics. While visually striking, Gold falls short in its story. Helm, as usual, shines in her small role, and Hans Albers is quite the leading man. It's the most visually appealing of the six films in this episode, and wish the story matched the cinematography and set design. Much could be added to a discussion of any German film made at this time about Nazi propaganda and how those involved in making these films fared. 
the director refused to flee and found ways to refuse to make Nazi films. Star Hans Albers was so popular, he was never forced to join the Nazi party. Gold is available on DVD and Blu-ray and is available to watch for free on YouTube. I'll link it in the description below. Early Argentinian cinema predominantly featured comedies, musicals, and documentaries, with genres like science fiction and horror lagging behind in popularity. El Hombre Bestia, or The Beast Man, is a rare early Argentinian sci-fi film that failed to capture the imagination of its audience. Directed by Camilo Zachary Soprani, a former journalist turned filmmaker, he is better known for his writings and textbooks on filmmaking. The film had an extremely low budget, and the use of amateur actors could not save the story, resulting in a forgettable production. Despite attempts to utilize natural lighting and local settings in Rosario, Argentina, the film's inexplicable storyline and disjointed editing contributed to its lack of success. The plot revolves around a pilot who, after crashing in a forest, is left alone for years. He is then kidnapped and transformed into a beast man by a scientist. The beast man then embarks on a rampage of kidnapping women. Though the film quickly faded into obscurity after its release, it was considered lost. It resurfaced around the year 2000 when the son of one of the actors found his father's negatives and had the footage converted into VHS tapes. Not realizing the value of their find, the negatives were thrown away and only the VHS remained. It is not known how much of the original film is lost. Unfortunately, this is not a good film, but I would recommend checking it out if you are interested in the fascinating glimpse into the early days of Argentinian sci-fi filmmaking. The Spanish-language documentary In the Footsteps of the Beast provides further insight into the film's production and legacy. The Beast Man and its accompanying documentary are now available on YouTube. I'll link both in the description below. Universal Pictures' 12-episode serial, The Vanishing Shadow, is different from most sci-fi serials of the time, in that the gadgets are actually important to the plot and not just cool visuals and MacGuffins. Actor-turned-director Lou Landers Helm the series, Onslow Stevens, Ada Ince, and James Durkin star. And like most serials of the time, the plot is kind of crazy. Stanley Stanfield joins forces with an inventor to build a contraption that makes the wearer invisible, except for his shadow. Our main character seeks revenge for his father's murder while dealing with corrupt stockbrokers and a romance with the villain's estranged daughter. There are lots of fistfights, car chases, and exploding cars at the end of each episode. But at the beginning of the next episode, it turns out everything is just fine. There's a vanishing ray, a destroying ray, and a robot that can be controlled by radio. An early handheld ray gun was used in the story, a gadget that would go on to become a popular weapon in later sci-fi films. These 12 episodes are fun to watch, and I like how the sci-fi elements were added to the story world that would be quite mundane if it wasn't for the inventions. The gadgets make the story seem far-fetched, but that's part of the fun. The episodes were considered to be lost until 2010. Before that time, the only available footage was a three-minute trailer held in the George Eastman House collection, but couldn't be shown due to the instability of the negatives. The Vanishing Shadow is available on DVD and Blu-ray. A colorized version is on the Internet Archive, and the black and white version is available on YouTube. I'll link them in the description below. The last of the mostly forgotten films of 1934 is Once in a New Moon, a British low-budget production written and directed by Anthony Kimmins. The film stars Elliot Makem, Renee Ray, and Morton Selton. On a fun side note, Renee Ray would go on to write several novels and screenplays, including the science fiction serial and its novelization, 
the strange world of Planet X in the 1950s. Once in a New Moon is an adaptation of Owen Rudder's 1929 novel Lucky Star. It unfolds an extraordinary tale where the tranquil English town of Shrimpton-by-the-Sea is torn from the Earth's surface by the magnetic force of a passing dead star. This transforms the town into a miniature globe orbiting the Earth, with its own accelerated day-night cycle and Earth hanging in the sky like a new moon. As the town folk grapple with the new reality, the initial chaos leads to the establishment of a makeshift government. The societal upheaval soon exposes underlying class tensions, threatening to spiral into civil strife with the newly christened Shrimpton in Space. We must keep our heads high as we face bravely the changed conditions in which from now on we shall have to live. Once in a New Moon epitomizes the era's quota quickies, a category of films produced by the UK as part of a legislative effort to bolster the domestic film industry. Starting in 1927, British cinemas were mandated to screen a minimum quota of British-made films to compete with those out of Hollywood. It's a fascinating idea, but the science is more fantastical than realistic. The sci-fi elements are used to put the characters into a chaotic situation and discuss class struggles in 1930s Britain. In the end, I thought it was entertaining and cute, more fantasy than sci-fi. It promised more than it delivered, and wanted to deal more with politics between capitalist and communist than anything else. Once in a New Moon is available to rent on YouTube and Amazon Prime in the United States. The science fiction literature of 1934 left more of an impact on the public consciousness than the films, and not only shaped the landscape of the science fiction genre, but also inspired future sci-fi adventures. After Worlds Collide by Edwin Balmer and Philip Wiley is the sequel to When Worlds Collide. It follows the story of a group of survivors who escape Earth's destruction by traveling to a newly discovered planet. When Worlds Collide producer George Powell was planning on making a film adaptation of this sequel, but could not get the funding after the failure of Conquest of Space in 1955. The Legion of Space by Jack Williamson, set in the distant future where humanity has colonized the galaxy and follows the adventures of a group of space explorers known as the Legion. E.E. E. Doc Smith published both Skylark of Valeran and Triplanetary. Skylark, published in serial form, is the continuing story of Richard Seaton encountering advanced civilizations and epic battles. The space opera Triplanetary follows the conflict between two rival civilizations and the emergence of a select group of individuals who wield extraordinary powers, who combat evil and maintain cosmic order. Most novels and pulp magazines printed this year were never adapted into film or television productions, with one notable exception. On January 7, 1934, the now iconic hero Flash Gordon burst onto the scene as a comic strip created by artist Alex Raymond. Set in a fantastical universe, it chronicles the adventures of the daring hero Flash Gordon and his encounters with alien races, advanced technologies, and formidable foes like Ming the Merciless. The popularity of Flash Gordon quickly transcended the comic strip medium leading to adaptations across various forms of entertainment, from radio serials to movie serials, multiple television series, and a 1980 feature film. Flash Gordon became a cultural phenomenon, captivating audiences with his daring exploits and larger-than-life adventures. And one birthday of note. Carl Sagan, the renowned astrophysicist and author, was born on November 9th. His ability to convey complex scientific concepts to the general public was seen in his television series, Cosmos, A Personal Voyage, which aired in 1980, and his novel Contact, 
later adapted into a critically acclaimed film in 1997, showcased his unique blend of science fiction and deep scientific knowledge. Through his tireless efforts to popularize science, Sagan's legacy continues to inspire and educate generations about the wonders of the universe. Amidst widespread economic hardship, political tensions simmered, with rising authoritarianism in Europe and Asia, setting the stage for future conflict. Meanwhile, cultural and scientific innovations flourished, with groundbreaking developments in literature, cinema, and technology, offering glimpses of hope and inspiration in this era of uncertainty. To fully grasp the sci-fi films of 1934, it's necessary to take a brief look at the event shaping the collective human experience. And so, for the rest of this episode, I will focus on the world at large that played a role in influencing filmmakers and storytellers. Throughout 1934, notorious American bank robber John Dillinger gained infamy for a series of daring heists across the Midwest, United States, evading capture by law enforcement until July 22nd when he was fatally shot by FBI agents in Chicago. Outlaws Bonnie and Clyde met their violent end in a police ambush in Louisiana after a notorious crime spree. Their deaths marked the conclusion of a sensationalized criminal saga that captivated the nation. The Soviet Union joined the League of Nations, while Japan renounced the Washington Naval Treaty of 1922 and the London Naval Treaty of 1930. On March 1st, a Japanese puppet state established in Manchuria in 1932 declared itself a monarchy in 1934. This solidified Japanese control over the region and marked a significant shift in the political landscape of East Asia during this period and lasted until 1945. The United States experienced significant drought and dust storms throughout the 1930s, leading to the ecological and agricultural disaster known as the Dust Bowl. 1934 was one of the worst years, with massive dust storms sweeping across the Great Plains, causing widespread damage to crops, livestock, and property. From June 30th to July 2nd, the Night of the Long Knives, a brutal purge orchestrated to eliminate internal dissent within the Nazi party, solidified Hitler's authoritarian control and signaled the beginning of a more centralized and dictatorial regime. Hitler would then assume the title of Fuhrer of Germany on August 2nd, consolidating the roles of head of state and chancellor, following the death of President and World War I veteran Paul von Hindenburg. The Red Army of the Chinese Communist Party, led by Mao Zedong, undertook a strategic retreat known as the Long March on October 16th. This journey covered thousands of miles and lasted until October 1935. While the march was a military setback, it allowed the communists to regroup and eventually establish themselves as a significant force in China's civil war. However, not everything was doom and gloom, especially within the arts and entertainment. Originally opened in 1913, the Apollo Theater, the historic venue in Harlem, New York City, reopened its doors in 1934 as a cultural hub for African-American performers and showcased a variety of talent, including jazz and blues musicians, as well as comedians. F. Scott Fitzgerald's novel, Tender is the Night, captured the zeitgeist of the jazz age, offering a poignant exploration of love decadence, and the disillusionment of the American dream, solidifying Fitzgerald's reputation as one of the era's foremost novelists. Dashiell Hammett's novel, The Thin Man, introduced readers to the witty and sophisticated detective duo Nick and Nora Charles as they navigated a captivating murder mystery, inspiring numerous adaptations in radio, television, and a film adaptation. Cole Porter's Anything Goes opened at the Alvin Theater, and the now iconic song Blue Moon was written this year by Rogers and Hart. 
The Dick Tracy Radio Series premiered in New England on NBC Radio, and the Donald Duck comic strip made its debut. The year also saw the establishment of the Federal Communications Commission, a significant development in telecommunications regulation in the United States. This was propelled by the Communications Act of 1934. It granted the FCC authority over broadcasting licenses and content, laying the groundwork for the future regulation and expansion of radio and television broadcasting. Several technological innovations include Introduction of the 135 film cartridge, also known as 35 millimeter film. It simplified the process of loading and unloading film, making photography more accessible and a medium of artistic expression for everyone. On August 25th, Philo Farnsworth conducted the world's first public demonstration of a complete all electronic television system. This groundbreaking event utilized electronic scanning to transmit and display images, marking a pivotal moment in the history of entertainment, laying the foundation for modern television. The American film industry began its rigorous enforcement of the Motion Picture Production Code in 1934. During the 1920s, there were growing concerns about Hollywood's potential influence on society after several scandals and there were calls for censorship and regulations. Known as the Hayes Code, it was written in 1930 and went into full effect on July 1, 1934. Over the last few episodes, I've discussed pre-code films. After July, stricter rules would go into effect, regulating the content of films, moral standards, prohibition of profanity, nudity, drug use, and other controversial subjects. The code would remain in effect until its eventual decline in the 1960s. When discussing the sci-fi films from 1934, it's essential to consider the broader context of the industry as a whole. And though this channel is about science fiction, I do want to highlight some notable non-sci-fi films and industry milestones of the year. This is not an exhaustive discussion of the year, but just a snapshot of events. On May 5th, the Three Stooges appeared in their first short, Woman Haters. MGM purchased the rights to The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, though the film would not be released until 1939. This year saw the debuts of Gene Autry in In Old Santa Fe, Donald Duck in The Wise Little Hen, Rita Hayworth in Cruz Diablo, and Rosalind Russell in Evelyn Prentice. Popular serials were the Western drama The Mystery Mountain, as well as The Law of the Wild starring Rin Tin Tin and Tailspin Tommy based on the comic strip. The Oscars for the films released in 1934 made history. For the first time, the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences awarded a single film with its top five trophies. It Happened One Night, starring Clark Gable and Claudette Colbert, won Best Picture, director for Frank Capra, actor, actress, and also for its screenplay by Robert Riskin. This feat would only be repeated by One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and The Silence of the Lambs. The romantic comedy follows the unlikely romance between a runaway heiress and a cynical reporter as they embark on a cross-country journey. This was one of the last prominent pre-code romantic comedies released before the production code went into full effect. The other notable films released in this year include The Black Cat, directed by Edgar G. Ulmer, starred Boris Karloff and Bella Lugosi. This horror film is based on Edgar Allan Poe's story. It was Universal's biggest hit of the year and the first of eight films pairing Lugosi and Karloff. Maniac, also known as Sex Maniac, an early exploitation film known as one of the worst films ever made. Directed by Dwayne Esper, it follows the lurid and sensationalized story of a mad scientist who kidnaps women and subjects them to bizarre experiments. The Gay Divorcee 
a musical comedy directed by Mark Sandrich and starring Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. It's about a woman seeking a divorce who falls in love with a dancer while staying at a seaside resort. This was the second of 10 films featuring this iconic duo. Cleopatra, directed by Cecil B. DeMille, starred Claudette Colbert. The film follows the legendary Egyptian queen as she navigates political intrigue, romantic entanglements, and her ultimate tragic downfall. The Thin Man, directed by W.S. Van Dyke and starring William Powell and Myrna Loy. This mystery comedy introduces audiences to the detective duo Nick and Nora Charles as they investigate a murder case while navigating the high society of New York City. Imitation of Life, directed by John M. Stahl, stars Claudette Colbert and Louise Beavers and explores issues of race, identity, and motherhood as two women, one white and one black, navigate their lives and careers. The Man Who Knew Too Much, directed by Alfred Hitchcock, this British thriller starring Peter Lorre and Leslie Banks follows an ordinary couple who become embroiled in international espionage while vacationing in Switzerland. Hitchcock would direct another film with the same title in 1956, starring James Stewart and Doris Day. Though few of the science fiction films of 1934 are remembered today, cinema and entertainment took strides forward with technical innovations in television and with projects from rising filmmakers like Alfred Hitchcock, while taking steps backward with the enforcement of the production code. 1934 was a year of building and reinvention. The debut of Flash Gordon would become the most important sci-fi creation of the year. Thank you so much for watching. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe for more History of Sci-Fi content. And I'll see you in 1935.